Thank you, Kimberly, for that wonderful introduction. And it's been great to be a colleague throughout the years and to see you at this event as well. So I'm going to be sharing with you the results of a body of work that's really been a labor of love, a longitudinal study that's now moved into intervention work on helping young women and girls as well as young boys and young men overcome the consequences of violence in their lives, um, drawing from work in West Africa. <clears throat> so I'm going to talk a little bit about mental health and resilience in war-affected children, the social ecological model that underpins a lot of our work, um, the longitudinal study and how we've drawn from this in intervention development, um, including a recent randomized control trial and the results from that, um, and then implications for policy and programming moving forward. So to talk a little bit about um, the issue we're facing with exposure to violence in conflict-affected countries, it's estimated by UNICEF that worldwide over one billion children live in regions affected by armed conflict. So this is not a side issue. This is a central issue to the lives of children around the world. Uh, another backdrop to this is that the nature of war itself is changing. We're seeing an increase in international conflicts um, involving non-state actors, regional conflicts with militia groups, rebel groups, terrorism, uh, which has an effect of targeting the fabric of day-to-day -day life, targeting civilians, targeting schools, targeting hospitals. And this has implications for the immediate survival of children, um, but also the trajectory of development they're set upon in life, what opportunities are available to them as they grow, including access to education, as well as the consequences on their mental health and development in terms of interacting with those opportunities. And it's not movie, but that's okay. Um, so when we talk about mental health and war-affected youth, we know from a range of studies that children exposed to war suffer from higher rates of post-traumatic stress reactions, anxiety, depression, but also behavioral consequences of these exposures, such as um, problems in getting along with others, problems with anger, problems with hopelessness. Um, if you look at just studies on child soldiers, which is a topic I've done a lot of work on, in northern Uganda alone, where there have been a range of studies, we see rates of post-traumatic stress disorder uh, estimated anywhere from 27% to about 35%. In similar populations in Nepal, we've seen estimates of about 55%. Um, however, we have some real gaps in our knowledge. Uh, first of all, a lot of this research has sort of been one point in time cross-sectional studies. And we have very little knowledge about the longitudinal course of these problems and what are protective processes that lead to better outcomes when children are exposed to such violence. Uh, we also know very little about the post-conflict environment. We have a lot of attention during periods of crisis, but then when all of that evaporates and the next crisis is in the news, what really happens to the lives of women and girls, um, as well as young men growing up in these environments? And there's very little attention um, to intervention at the same time. So we know about how terrible war is, but we're not really building that evidence base on how to intervene. So this is where we've tried to place our work. And when we talk about child development or mental health and any um, child exposed to violence, we have to think developmentally and ecologically. And so we really are moving across these different interrelated systems. So certainly any one child's outcomes depend on things like individual factors, age, gender, temperament, intelligence, genetic history, uh, but also what's going on at the level of the family, who's available to the child, what's the nature of caregiver mental health and functioning, resources in the family, and you can't stop there. You have to move out to the larger level of society, of the community, um, to the social networks that can provide uh, attachment relationships when caregivers aren't present for children, uh, to opportunities to pursue an education or a livelihood. And then we have to move out to the level of the macro system as well, the historical, the political context that often is at the root of the conflict itself, as well as understanding attitudes about uh, reconciliation, about healing, and uh, how that's interpreted societally. So let's move now to Sierra Leone. Um, it used to be when I would give a talk, um, people had never heard of Sierra Leone. It was a country that was um, less in the news. Um, but now, since the historic Ebola outbreak, um, everyone seems to know where Sierra Leone is. Here you have on the coast of West Africa, next to Liberia, Cote d'Ivoire, and Guinea. Um, this is a country with some of the highest rates of maternal mortality and infant mortality in the world before the outbreak of Ebola, and a long and horrific history of civil war from 1991 to 2002. Now, features of the Sierra Leonean war um, involved massive population displacement, um, the sort of um, well-known abduction of children into armed forces and armed groups. It's estimated uh, that in this country of six million people, about 20,000 children were forced into um, militia groups and um, the Revolutionary United Front rebel group. 
Um, and a feature of how the rebels would conduct themselves is they would often force children to commit atrocities against loved ones, against community members, with the idea being that it would sever ties, that they'd feel they could never run away and be accepted back home. But the reality was, at the end of the war, thousands of children were coming out of fighting forces, and it became a big debate what would be in their best interest. And it was decided, if at all possible, they should return home to their families and communities. And it was around that time that we started a longitudinal study with the International Rescue Committee, um, and also supported um, by USAID, um, to study risk and protective processes over time. Um, for the first time, to begin to look at what are factors that shape better trajectories or more risky trajectories. And this is a study of girls and of boys. It's mixed methods, so we're involving um, sort of in-depth qualitative data collection, but also repeat surveys over time. So we've had three ways of data collection. 2002 was when we first began. We came back again in 2004, and then again in 2008. Um, we now have support from the National Institutes of Child Health and Development um, to make this an intergenerational study of war. We've never had that opportunity before to follow prospectively these young girls as they become mothers, as they start um, relationships in the community um, and intimate partner relationships. Um, the sample is about one-third female. If we can find all of them, there are 529 of them that we've been following as they grow. Um, and we've been able to retain about 70% of the sample over time, uh, which has been quite a feat and really a testament to our local team. Now, I wanted to talk about brain development and toxic stress a little bit. So just to give you a snapshot of the type of violence exposures that young people in this sample experienced, this is from a paper that we published <clears throat> in the journal Child Development a few years ago, uh, looking at the former child soldiers in the sample. Think about the developmental consequences of experiences like this. Average age of abduction into an armed group was just over 10 years of age. Average length of time with fighting forces was about four years on average. So imagine being taken from your family at age 10 and socialized by an armed group for four years of your life. The repeated uh, stress exposures that that involves. And then when we looked by gender at violence exposure, in terms of frontline fighting, being trained, carrying weapons, being involved in reconnaissance missions, girls and boys were very similar in this particular setting in terms of these violence exposures and participation. Um, but then when it came to sexual violence, as you might imagine, for girls it was off the charts at 45% of girls in our sample reporting a history of sexual violence and 5% of boys, and we can't forget those boys as well. Uh, but and those are likely numbers that are underreported. In our sample, about a quarter, uh, over a quarter, reported being involved in committing acts of violence and being involved in injuring or killing other people. You can imagine the consequences of that. And this is oftentimes under duress of being killed yourself if you don't participate. And about 50% of the sample was forced to take drugs or alcohol to get them involved in these atrocities. Um, now, when we look at the consequences of these experiences over time, and I'm not going to have time to go into all of the analyses and um, different ways in which we've approached the data, but there are many publications of uh, a large team that have worked on this data set. But what's really important about what we've learned is it's not just the war exposures, it's also what happens in the post-conflict environment. Certainly there are very toxic war exposures that we've learned about in our data. Uh, issues like surviving rape are associated with depression, with anxiety later on in life. Participation in injuring or killing others um, is, is associated with problems with hostility and deficits in your interpersonal relationships with others. Um, but also the post-conflict environment really matters. And young people who came back to stigma, uh, as well as low so social support, limited school access, look much worse over time. And it's really the confluence of those post-conflict factors and the war-related factors that matter. And what we see in the young people, there's a lot of resilience in this study, and I think that's the message I always want people to leave here with, that the Children who are suffering and continue to really underfunction today are a minority group in the sample. Um, so there is tremendous resilience, and there are leverage points um, that we saw protective relationships with things like community acceptance, when communities accepted people back after the war, um, being able to stay in school, uh, having someone who's attached to you, who's committed to you, having social support in your life. These are all very important protective processes and these outcomes. But there, there are subgroups that really um, underfunction in terms of life opportunities, especially when it comes to education. And um, those are those who are most affected by the toxic stress exposures. Now to just talk about this toxic stress concept a little bit. We know that the healthy development of a nation's children and youth is the foundation for long-term prosperity. 
Um, and we can think about stress in three levels. Um, the first is what we might call um, stress that we all experience day to day that's actually positive stress, like giving up to give a talk. It activates your bodily stress, your body's stress response. You have brief increases in heart rate. Um, you have changes in your stress hormone levels, but you get through it, you enjoy it, you might do it again. You learn from these things. Now we have tolerable stress experiences. These are serious but temporary stress responses that many children as they grow up experience, going through um, and being involved in a frightening medical procedure or being in an accident. Uh, but these stress responses are getting activated but they're buffered by attachment figures, by those people in your life who help to soothe you. Now when you look at the sort of violence exposures that I just showed you in our data, we're really in the domain of toxic stress. And we're talking about repeat activation of the body's stress response system without those buffering relationships without the opportunity to be soothed um, over multiple periods of time. And as you can imagine, those sorts of responses again and again and again begin to affect the developing brain. They get under the skin. And we know from a range of research that young children who experience chronic neglect, frequent abuse, or continuous exposure to environmental threats are at increased risk of these deficits in their development. And toxic stress can derail healthy development and it has lasting consequences for learning, which really matters for the topic that you're talking about today, for behavior and for long-term health. And we've seen this in a range of studies. And this is because toxic stress gets under the skin. And we know from great research, this is a slide from the Harvard Center on the Developing Child and Jack Schoenkopf's work, um, that uh, early experience shapes the developing brain architecture. And when we talk about the stress response, we're involving the sort of ancient areas of the brain, the hippocampus and the amygdala, but also the prefrontal cortex, which is the area of the brain that's involved in decision-making and attention. So you can imagine that has real consequences for people being able to perform when they then get a school opportunity if they've had repeat violence exposure early in childhood. Um, just to give you an example from our research um, that helps ground this, this is a profile of a young woman that I'll call Amina. Um, she was 23 year old when we last interviewed her. Um, just like the sample, she was abducted at the age of 10, spent two and a half years with rebel groups um, as a supply carrier and a cook. She was beaten frequently um, throughout her time with the rebels. She has a lasting leg deformity because of this. Um, and was involved in um, horrific acts of violence, including amputations of other people. Now when Amina went through re rehabilitation and reintegration processes, she was returned to her mother and to a grandmother. Uh, she's a single mom, she's raising a child on her own. When Amina first went to school, as you might imagine, she had some trouble getting along with others. She had real issues with trust. She was a handful for the teacher. Uh, and her mother would go and advocate for Amina. And she would beg the school, please have patience with her. She would try to problem solve in the community when people would stigmatize or point fingers. Now Amina slowly, because the school began to be sensitized to the consequences of violence and what it meant for her behavior, and she had a mother who was committed, she started to adjust over time. Um, now she's a dedicated student. Um, most people in the community don't even remember that she was once with the rebels, and she's gone on to really feel good about her future and continue to be quite productive. Now, Amina is the kind of case we'd like to see, but there are many young people in Sierra Leone subgroups who don't have those sources of guidance in their life, but struggle with the consequences of violence and what it means for them interpersonally and in connect connecting to life opportunities. Um, Sierra Leone, before Ebola, was on track in terms of its development. Um, the World Bank had just launched a $20 million youth employment scheme that's coming back around now. Youth are a priority for the development agenda. But there are big issues like teen pregnancy, which has increased terribly under the Ebola epidemic when the schools were closed. Um, and the most troubled youth, like kids who don't have the support Amina had, need uh, opportunities to get their lives back on track. But really what's happening is the highest functioning youth are the ones who get the employment opportunities or who are able to stay in school when those free opportunities are there. And this brought us to this concept of the need for readiness. How do we bring up all boats? How do we help the young people who don't have those skills yet to take advantage of something like an educational opportunity? So this was the development of the Youth Readiness Intervention, which is based in the longitudinal study. Um, we did some preliminary work to look at the context. We interviewed key stakeholders in Sierra Leone, elders, youth themselves, parents, people working with youth exposed to violence, and did an assessment of the situation. One thing that's very clear in trying to deliver interventions like this is there are limited human resources. This country of six million people doesn't have a single active psychiatrist in the country. 
There are two psychologists, a handful of master's level people with the burden of violence in Sierra Leone. Um, so we had to think about models that could be done by community health workers with excellent training and supervision. We had to think about working in groups because it's a collectivist culture and that's a real resource and strength. We had to think of this um, history of complex trauma affecting young people and that it, you can't just go after one thing, PTSD only, you have to think about depression too. So what can we do that cuts across different ranges of problems? And we had to think about not just mental health treatment but linking these opportunities for a future to what we could do for young people in terms of helping them with the consequences of violence. Um, so the intervention itself has many components that you see in trauma-informed treatment. There's a focus on stabilization, on integration of past difficult memories, and then also focusing on the future, problem solving, um, improving your interpersonal skills, your navigation of life stressors, because as you can imagine, especially in post-Ebola Sierra Leone, these are very difficult environments um, and more and more fraying of the community connections. Um, now these components, things such as emotion regulation skills, behavioral activation, problem solving skills, these are all elements of treatments that we've seen um, used in the United States and the UK that have a strong evidence base, but they've not been tested in war affected settings. Um, so in the youth readiness intervention, it's, it's, um, what we've been able to do is really build this evidence base related to war affected and low resource settings. We use cultural um, content throughout our intervention manual. We're learning phrases, proverbs, so that young people who don't have basic literary, literacy can connect to the content of the intervention. Um, we draw in local examples that are relevant to the lives of these young women and girls as they problem solve, as they think about the sort of challenging situations they have to move through in life. Um, now, we just finished this um, evaluation of the intervention. Because we had the longitudinal study, we could screen in people that we knew were at highest levels of distress, had impairments in day-to-day -day functioning using measures we'd used before, who wanted to get back into school if given the chance, and we followed in the enrollment the UN definition of youth, people ages 15 to 24, um, and working with girls uh, and boys in separate groups, uh, also divided by age, so younger girls together, older girls together, led by female interventionists. In Freetown, Sierra Leone, and this is before the Ebola outbreak, we were very readily able to screen 760-some youth and find many young people with elevated levels of distress over a matter of weeks to participate. Half were randomized to readiness and then a school opportunity. The other half went straight to the school opportunity. Now, to just show you a little bit about what we learned, um, and just to give you a summary, these are 10 sessions, um, so it's not extremely cost costly to do these interventions. We're doing them in um, dedicated spaces in the community, donated by community leaders, empty schools on the weekends. We're looking at things like emotion regulation, social support, and day-to-day -day functioning. Um, but you also see in our sample very high exposure to violence, kids who were separated from a caregiver due to war or had a friend or family member die. So violence is ever present in their lives. And then these are our results. Um, when we looked pre to post intervention, we got really exciting traction on young people's ability to regulate their strong reactions to stressors, um, to their sense of interpersonal uh, skills and their sense of them, their self-efficacy, to day-to-day -day functioning and to social support, and especially with those who had the highest levels of problems in pro-social behaviors as well as lowest social support. Um, what's also exciting to look at education is after the intervention, young girls um, and uh, the boys in the trial went on to the educational program, and we found that youth who'd gotten the readiness intervention were six times more likely to persist in school compared to the control group. Um, not only that, the teachers who didn't know who was in which group rated the kids who'd gotten the intervention as being better behaved in the classroom, showing better attendance. So we're on to something exciting here. It's very preliminary. Um, we're now working with the World Bank. I'm actually here for a, a meeting at the World Bank about integrating these sort of readiness interventions into youth employment programs. Um, but just to wrap up, um, I want to summarize um, by hoping that all of you leave here understanding how much it's important that we attend to mental health and child development when we think about things like education, that exposure to violence does have lasting consequences for learning, for behavior, and for long-term life health, that we have to understand these consequences to help youth really connect to life opportunities like the chance to be back in school, community-based interventions that are inexpensive are possible, and that we can really think about integration across platforms, working within the education sector to bring mental health to bear in the lives of young children. Um, so I'd like to just wrap up with this quote from a young woman in one of our groups. She says, I didn't know after the end of the war how to interact with people. I was so aggressive, but since I went through the readiness intervention, my life has changed. And it's that sort of sense of agency that we hope to promote in the work we do. So I'll wrap up and thank you.